I will present my experience uh, with the surgery of rotator cuff. First of all, I have to disclose that all studies that I performed and are shown in this presentation are spontaneous and did not receive any support. So when we speak about rotator cuff, we know that is a partial or complete insertional footprints lesion on the humeral surface of one of the rotator cuff muscle. This is the shoulder pathology with the highest incidence in the adult population. Prevalence is around 20 to 30% after six years old. And the supraspinaros tendon is the one that is mostly involved. So we will speak about the early history and open repair of rotator cuff, the beginning of arthroscopic surgery, current concept and techniques, the results and the future developments. Let's speak about early history and the open repair. You can, found, you can find more details on the paper we published in the Kesta Journal in 2015. And it's really, really a deep, deep, uh, deep article about that. So the story starts in 1778 with Alexander Morrow in Edinburgh. He was the first one to describe rotator cuff tear. But we need to wait for 50 uh, years to have another uh, colleague from uh, London, John Smith, that it was the first one to describe a first series of rotator cuff tears in cadavers because they had the anatomical bill and means that the government allowed the surgeon to work on cadavers. And this was a great step for medical doctors in UK especially. Then in between 1850 and 1870, a lot of surgeons, a lot of doctors from France, from uh, uh, Ireland, from, uh, uh, you know, mostly Europe, they try to understand what was the etiology behind shoulder pain in Malgain. First is that the rotator calf tear after the dislocation can be the, the reason mostly about the, the shoulder pain. And in 1817, Hutter was the first surgeon to describe a, a repair of the rotator cuff after a humeral resection. <coughs> in, in 1898, Willem Müller from Germany was the first to repair a rotator cuff in an operation done for instability. But it was Georg von Pertes from the Bonn University in 19. 06 that described the first case series in Europe and was the first one to repair the suture anchor to use the suture anchor to repair the rotator cuff surgery. In the United States, things uh, happened later in 1934 and war was Ernest Codman that was able to describe the first case series in the United States and he was the first one uh, from the Massachusetts General Hospital to describe these kind of staples used to repair the calf uh, uh, in the bone. So the surgical treatment began open, of course, and the open surgery has been uh, uh, really widely used uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the last century. We, we have some milestones like the work of uh, McLaughlin that, that was able to show how to repair the retracted lesion. And in 1961, the Barry, he described the supraspinatus advancement. It was a, a, a French surgeon that worked together with Diepat, and they described how to lengthen the supraspinatus in retracted tear, always by an open surgeon. In 1972, uh, Charlie Near from New York described the acromioplasty. That means you remove part of the acromion to reduce the impingement with the rotator cuff. 
And in 1992, Luz Bigliani was the first one to speak about rotator cuff revision surgery. In 1986, Dr. Ozaki from Japan was the first one to use a, a scaffold made of Teflon to repair the rotator cuff. And in 1998, Christian Gerber from Zurich, uh, Switzerland was the one that described the musculotendinous transfer to uh, repair the torn and irreparable rotator cuff. Then, together with this story about rotator cuff surgery, we have to go and to study the, the history of arthroscopic surgery because the arthroscopic surgery came together with the shoulder surgery to treat the rotator cuff. So if we study the arthroscopic surgery, we have to go back to uh, a colleague that is Filippo Bozzini uh, with an Italian father and German mother that in 1806 uh, was the first one to describe the licked lighter that was the first endoscope that was used in urological operation. But then in 1880, uh, because of Tom Edison, that was uh, the first to, to patent a bowl in the United States, the two things put together allow in 1886 to Nitz and later to create the first uh, cystoscope with an, a, a bulb incorporated. So it was possible to do the first photograph of the interior of a bladder. Then this kind of technology was developed and in 1912, Severin Nordendorf was the first one to describe uh, the arthroscopy of an knee. And in 1918 and 1919, Kenny Takaji and Eugene Berker, they were the first one to use the arthroscopy uh, with case series in Japan and in Europe. In 1931, Michael Berman in the United States was the first one to use the arthroscopy in a shoulder, in a cadaver. And in 1957, the great father of the modern arthroscopy, Masaki Watanabe, uh, did the first atlas of arthroscopy. In 1958, the number one, number 21 arthroscope uh, became a production model. So shoulder arthroscopy finally grew up in 1985. Jimmy Andrews was the first one to do a debridement for partial rotator cuff tear in 1987. Dr. Elman was the first to describe a, a large case series of arthroscopic subacromial decompression. And in 1978, Masaki Watanabe was the first one to describe the posterior portal. In 1989, finally, Eugene Wolf uh, was describing the anterior portals. You can see Eugene Wolf together with myself uh, in a picture of more than 10 years ago. And then it was a transition in between mini open rotator cuff repair to uh, arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. We can find the paper of Howard Levy, 1990, that he did arthroscopic mini open assisted uh, rotator cuff repair. But then finally things, they became full arthroscopic. And this was uh, because of the great job of Steve Snyder, you can see a picture of 20 years ago that we had together. It was a great honor visiting this man. This was really a true pioneer in rotator cuff. And in 1994, he published this, uh, this very interesting and nice book about shoulder arthroscopy. And now we are coming to the surgery of today. So today the gold standard is still the single repair where we use anchors fixed in the bone that we can, uh, we can load with sutures and the sutures that go through the tendon and allow us to repair the rotator cuff. 
and finally this technique can be implemented and reproduce the open surgery that was done with transosseous tunnel. And this double row technique was developed by Steve Burkett, you can see here in the, in, in the small picture. And this, this is an effective strategy with some variation as the one described by Park with a suture bridge technique where you cross the suture. But things are developing very fastly. So in the last 10 years, it was possible to do a true transosseous arthroscopic repair with this device. The transosseous repair was already done in, a, in, a, in, a some, in a some very practical way in 2006, but now we are at the really arthroscopic transosseous. I mean, this is not a, a, a fission. This has some biological meaning that you fix through the bone. And this art, full arthroscopic transosseous is advantageous compared to the, to the transosseous equivalent because the transosseous equivalent described by Burkett can fail with the media row. So the arthroscopic transosseous is a, is a kind of winning procedure. We can do it with different tunneler techniques and suture configurations. You can do it with uh, uh, K-wires with needles, but now the best is these kind of devices. They allow you to do tunnels in through bone. And then you pass the sutures through the cuff and you re-anchor the cuff perfectly at the bone. You can do an X-box kind of repair or triple X-box. If the surgeon is very expert, can create three tunnels and crossing the suture after repair the cuff with a very good bony contact on the uh, footprint surface. The limitation of this kind of repair is longer surgery time, more difficult technique, and risk of tunnel failure. What about the results of rotator cuff surgery? What are the results in comparing the different techniques in the literature? So open repair, as good to excellent outcomes in terms of functional improvement in between 75 and 95% and pay relief from 85 to 100%. But if we look the results in this case series, looking with the MRI, we have a retail rate for open surgery in massive cap that is 57% of 10 years from now. And this has been published by Matthias Zamstein in 2008 in JBJS. And what, what about the arthroscopic repair? If we do a long-term results as we did and published in the American Journal of Prospects in 2019, then we, lo we looked at 102 patients at more than 10 years, the integrity of the supraspinatus in this general case series is 53.47%. So it means that whenever we repair open or arthroscopically, we have 50% of re-rupture at 10 years. Of course, in this case series, 85.15 of the patient, they were very satisfied and we, were able to show that if at the index procedure, the calf tear was less than two centimeters, the long-term results, they are very good, around 70% of calf integrity at 10 years. If the uh, damage of the calf was bigger, a retraction of, of three, four centimeters, then the possibility to have a calf integrity at 10 years dropped down to 28.95% of the cases. Another nice paper about uh, arthroscopic repair with the long-term MRI results is the one of Eoberer with 50% of re-rupture at 10 years and 83.3 excellent results despite the re-rupture. So in arthroscopic repair, we have an healing rate of 50%. But the patient satisfaction is much higher. So it means that despite we have some re-rupture in the calf, 
the patient at the long term, they are happy with the results, they are satisfied with the results in a percentage that range from 80% to 94%, as shown in the literature. But if we compare mini open versus arthroscopic repair, do we have any advantage? No difference in functional outcome, pain, and retail rate. If we compare open repair with any kind versus any kind of arthroscopic repair, we can find no difference for any repair method. If we compare the arthroscopic single row with a double row, the meta analysis, there is almost no difference in between. If we compare single row repair versus transosseous repair, even in this case, in the study we published in 2017, the American Journal of Sports Medicine, we were not able to find any difference in between these two techniques of repair. Maybe we had a, a reduction of pain in, uh, in the transosseous technique, maybe, maybe because uh, it's hardware-less. And if we compare transosseous arthroscopic versus transosseous equivalent, even here, no difference in terms of clinical outcomes. Transosseous repair maybe is less costly compared to the anchors. What about the transosseous long-term results? Even with the transosseous at long-term results, the revision surgery rate is around 70% in the long term. And in this study, we can say that even at the long term, the transosseous is working very well. But finally, in spite of a dramatic increase in the number of publications per year, there is little evidence that the results of rotator cuff repair are improving. So what we need to improve the results? We need to develop future developments to improve our results. Biological augmentation of tendon repair seems to be the right strategy to get an improvement in our results. So we have some bioactive molecules like growth factors, platelet-rich plasma, the PRP. PRP is a wall blood fraction containing high platelets concentration that provides a release of various growth factors involved in tissue healing. We pioneered the use of PRP in the rotator cuff. We published in 2008 this a pilot study showing that this is a safe technique with no complication. Then in, in the following years, we had uh, uh, several classification. We published in the end uh, clinical uh, surgery in 2012 uh, a, a, the possibility to use in the upper extremity uh, this kind of uh, uh, technology with the PRP, and we, we publish a, a classification as well. And that's uh, very important that you know what you are injecting. There is mostly two kinds of uh, possibility to take advantage of PRP. One is with injectable PRP and thrombin, and the other is with suturable PRP that you can uh, put in between the bone and the rotator cuff. But finally, we have a lot of papers, different level studies, different PRP formulation, different surgical technique, and different rehabilitation protocol. So, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to compare the kind of PRP, the concentration, the technology. So we, we can only rely mostly on the surgical use of PRP with the uh, review papers and meta-analysis. So one of those, one of the first one published in 2012 in the arthroscopy journal seems to show that the, re the retail rate for a small and medium sized tears is in favor of the use of PRP, 8% in PRP, 
versus 27% in the control group over a tear. And then in journal shoulder and album 2015, this group from China shows that PRP therapy may improve tendon to bone healing in patients with small or moderate rotator cuff tear. And this is another meta analysis. Another one in 2015 is affirming that PRP is an effective and safe way of reducing tear rates, especially for small and medium sized rotator cuff tear. But this is not cost effective. And, and I think this is the point that this is not cost effective. Actually, it's much more costly. So to have a cost effectiveness of the PRP nowadays, we have to show a, a reduced rate of at least 9.1% in the retail rate comparing to the control group with the standards in treatment. So finally, in a systematic review of meta-analysis, that is even a, a, a more, 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 more detailed group studies about uh, PRP publication, uh, they conclude saying that PRP does not universally improve retail rates or affected clinical outcome scores. However, the effects of PRP use on retail rates trend towards beneficial outcomes. So is still open the battle regarding the PRP. Is effective or not? But can we take advantage of cell-based tissue engineering to help in repairing and having better results in rotator cuff repair? So yes, of course, we can use stem cells, especially mesenchymal uh, adult multipotent stem cells. My area of expertise is not in the bone marrow uh, derived stem cells. My studies are regarding adipose derived stem cells and tendon derived stem cells. So we published in 2013. This 2013 has been a very, very interesting year for research in rotator cuff uh, uh, stem cells because four different groups throughout the world, they were uh, able to find stem cells in the shoulder. So we were able to take samples from rotator cuff and long end of the biceps and to uh, use uh, this tissue to detect stem cells. And finally, we found two different adult stem cells population from supraspinatus and long end of the biceps after the cell seeding. And, and this was really a result, a result very, very interesting because those stem cells, they allow to uh, permit uh, the uh, self-renewing uh, in vitro. They were clonogenic and multipotent, and they could be induced to differentiate into different cell types, including osteoblasts, adipocytes, and skeletal muscle. So, this was really a discover that opened a new world for us. How we can use these stem cells that we found in rotator cuff and long end of the bicep to improve calf healing? Our first idea was to harvest during rotator cuff repair some tissue to isolate the patient's tendon stem cells to do a lab expansion up to 100 million cells, and then to inject after three weeks, this expanded uh, population of stem cells in the patient itself. But this was a dream that was really destroyed from, from the reality because you need uh, very strong GMP requirements, is a two stage procedure, is very costly between 10 and 30,000 uh, euros per case. 
And then you need to use enzymes and additives. So cell therapy really can work on another kind of pathway. The pathway is the one that is described first by Dr. Kaplan. It is the one of medicinal signaling cell. That means that by a paracrine mechanism, you can stimulate stem cells to activate the stem cells resident in the tissue we are treating. So can we take advantage of the adipose tissue of the patient? Of course, we can use microfragmented adipose clusters that are made of stem cells in around 30%. And so we can have a population of stem cells that we can transfer. So we would like to see if this technology as really in the lab results, and then we can transfer these to the everyday clinic, everyday practice. So we did an experiment. We took, we did a lipospiration of the patient. Then we, uh, we put in a seeding plate, the tendon-derived stem cells that we have in, in, in our bank, then the adipose stem cells, adipose cluster in uh, another uh, tray. And those cells, they are not in contact each other. Just the medium is the same. So they can have a kind of exchange without being in contact. And so the paracrine mechanism can be shown in, in its effectiveness or not. So what we show, we were able to demonstrate that the stem cells exposed to the mesenchymal adipose stem cells, they really significantly increase in the proliferation rate. We didn't find any cytotoxic effect. And then we saw an expression of vascular endothelial growth factors that increased a lot. And you know that the tissue, they heal because of uh, the creation of new vessels, like in the picture you can see on your right. So having these very good results in the lab, we decide to use this uh, adipose tissue, mesenchymal stem cells, during surgery. So we designed this prospective randomized control trial where we repair the calf, as shown in this video. And finally, we repair the calf. We went in a dry condition. And in a dry condition, then we inject the adipose tissue on top of the rotator cuff repaired. Here is the procedure. You can see the adipose tissue being injected in between the cuff and the bone and over the rotator cuff, on top of the rotator cuff repair. And you can see that this stays there. It's not disappearing. Okay. That's the flow chart. We selected 177 patients. We allocate the patient 26 in the control group and 26 in the treatment group after a power analysis study. Then we lost a follow up some patients. And we finally, we did the analysis on 22 patients in the treatment group and sorry, 24 in the treatment group and 20, uh, 22 in the treatment group and 22 in the, in the control group. That's a clinical evaluation that was with the uh, score up to 18 months and the patient at 18 months did an MRI 
to compare the results. And finally, we had a clinical score at 24 months as well. So we were very, very satisfied with demographic data, no difference significantly between the two groups. Even intraoperatively, we did almost the same operation. And the primary outcome results with the constant Smarly showed that we had the improvement from the baseline for, for both group, but strong statistically significant difference at six months follow-up for the constant Smarly, especially in the treatment group. So if you receive mesenchyma stem cells at six months from a constant Smarly score, you are much better. And then at two years, the results is the same. The control group and the treatment group, they scored the same. Regarding all the other outcomes measurements using Bonferroni's correction due to the several comparison between the two groups in the secondary outcomes, only external rotation strength was significantly uh, superior in the treatment group. At two years, we were not able to find any difference between the group. And regarding the MRI, we had less cases of repair in the treatment group with mesenchymal stem cells, but unfortunately, from a statistical point of view, this data is, makes no difference. We had no adverse event at two years follow-up. So the treatment group, was superior in constant Smarly score at six months, external rotation strength at six months, with no difference at 24 months of follow. In conclusion, the 10 non-resident stem cells exist, can be isolated, characterized, and expanded in vitro and possesses an high regenerative potential. The adipose mesenchyma stem cells are medical signaling cells, which can activate tendons resident progenitor cells by a paracrine mechanism. Our in vitro studies support their use. The microfragmented adipose tissue treatment is a practical and cost effective new therapeutic approach to improve clinical results of rotator cuff repair in the early phase after surgery. So, what is the take on message of this uh, presentation? Rotator cuff surgery, whatever kind, can assure a 50% of tendon healing with 80 to 95% of patients satisfied with the clinical results. Actually, the gold standard is an arthroscopic single row repair. Biology seems to be a nice option to improve our results. PRP results are contradictory and this is not cost effective. Scaffolds needs to be investigated. Adipose mesenchyma stem cells seems to be promising but we are just at the sunrise. I thank you very much for your attention.